So, thanks very much for having me here. My name is Mark McLaughlin. Um, I'm in the CTO office at Red Hat. I'm, I'm the OpenStack technical lead at Red Hat for, for, for OpenStack. Um, today, I wanted to, rather than follow Mark's talk with kind of a Red Hat-centric talk, I wanted to firmly put my kind of upstream hat on and kind of really focus on um, the upstream project. Uh, so the, the talk I'm going to give might seem at first a little bit unusual for this kind of an audience. Um, hopefully, we have a lot of users here. Um, and, as opposed to kind of OpenStack upstream developers, but bear with me for a while. So um, what kind of put this topic into my head was in Atlanta when Jonathan announced the, um, you know, the latest statistics for, for OpenStack and that there was four, now 460 monthly active contributors, which I think is the really important statistic. It's not the all-time number of contributors, it's the actual active number of contributors every month. And there was some discussion kind of at the board level, just you know, casual conversation amongst board, board members about whether this might actually be too large a number, whether we've suddenly become you know, too big a project. We have too many developers. Would we do a lot better if we had a smaller number of developers, um, if we had like some sort of a, 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 a quality bar that new contributors must pass before they could contribute to the project? Um, and it's interesting conversation, interesting debate to have, but you know, it, doesn't really ring true to me because I look at this room and there's what there's about 466 people here, and I really wonder to myself, you know, why couldn't everyone here contribute in some way to OpenStack? Why couldn't everyone here, in some way, consider themselves an OpenStack contributor? So maybe we should be aiming for a much much larger number. So it got me thinking about, you know, what do we expect from OpenStack contributors? You know, what what's this expectation that? The, you know, we, we had when we were having this discussion at, at the board level, you know, what do we want from our open, OpenStack developers? Um, and so this talk, kind of jokingly, is the idea is to try and de define the prototypical ideal OpenStack developer, you know, really dig into to what, what we're looking for here and what's, what's, what, 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 what would the hero of OpenStack be? Um, and, you know, I'm in Israel, so I'm not in the US, so I, I assume people get sarcasm here. You know, there's an awful lot of sarcasm coming here, but uh, so I'll get started. Anyway, so how do we begin forging, you know, this hero of OpenStack from the raw materials that we're pre presented with? You know, what's the, the kind of basics we might start with? Um, well, OpenStack is, you know, I guess exposing to users three types of resources, right? Virtualization. Um, networking storage. So we're in the home of KVM here, right? So maybe we might start with virtualization, right? So we, we take this new contributor and we start teaching them about, uh, about virtualization, the history of virtualization, going back from you know, mainframe days to you know, the fancy tricks that VMware did to do software virtualization to Zen and Paravert to um, you know, hardware-based virtualization that, that KVM is based on. You know, dig into understanding how KVM works. Dig into understanding how like hardware device assignment works with VTD and SRIOV. Right? Really dig into this stuff. And you know, if you, if you get that far, you might as well keep digging and really, really understand the x86 architecture, for example. Right? You might want to really understand how segmentation and um, you know, and memory management unit works, how interrupt paneling works, how the PCI device bus works. You know, really dig into this stuff. And you know, at a personal level, I'm starting with this because you know, I used to work on KVM, and actually I used to work on the GNOME desktop, and then I switched to work on KVM. And as part of that transition, I thought, well, you know, I really have to go back to my college days and understand some of this stuff. So I bought this book and went off to a library for a week and sat there and read it from cover to cover. Right? So maybe that's what we want every new OpenStack contributor to start with. Right? Take this book and go off and read it. Um, and then do the same for storage and do the same for networking, right? And now you might be good to go. You kind of understand the basic technologies we're starting with. Um, but, you know, OpenStack's a pretty complex distributed system, right? And there's a lot of, you know, we don't want OpenStack developers out there reinventing the wheel on distributed systems. We want them to really understand the, the kind of, <clears throat> you know, past learnings about how to build, build distributed systems. So, you know, you, want, you need to learn about what consensus is, how, what leadership algorithms are, um, you know, you want to be that smart guy who can joke that Paxos is the quick sort of distributed systems. Um, and we build our distributed system based on databases. And funnily enough, OpenStack has, you know, a preponderance of X MySQL consultants, but don't let that be your excuse. You know, you really need to understand how databases work, how, you know, your foreign keys from your, um, you know, cross, cross table, whatever. 
Um, you know, you just need to keep digging into all of this stuff, right? And messaging is another aspect of our, our distributed system, right? We're based on AMQP, but you might want to learn all about Corba and all the other messaging systems out there. Um, but now we want to actually get into some coding, right? So, you know, OpenStack's based on Python. Oh, uh, yeah, OpenStack's based on Python, so you want to start there. And I think we want all our OpenStack developers to be real Pythonists, right? People who really understand not just the basic kind of syntax of, of Python or even the most advanced syntax like, you know, meta classes and iterators and decorators and all that good stuff, but we want them to really kind of have good taste and understand when to use all these things. And to also really understand, you know, the ecosystem of Python libraries out there and which is the right Python library to use for different things. And we're also porting OpenStack to Python 3. So you really need to understand the differences between Python 2 and Python 3. And bear in mind, this is all before you get started working on OpenStack. But, you know, I don't really think someone's a real programmer if they just started with Python, right? You've got to learn, you've got to start with C. You've got to al al learn how to allocate your own memory. You've got to learn how to deal with py pointers, all that good stuff. Um, and then you might be ready to start. So he here's another book. Um, it's just one of, a, a book that sits on my desk, one of my personal favorites. Um, you know, if you really want to, to dig into this kind of stuff, it might be good to understand how to write, say, a, you know, um, a, a, a server program that can handle multiple requests at once with, with your own handwritten event loop. And this is the guy for that. You know, and if you really want to be the, the smart guy in the, in, the, in the block, you want to have Canoe's four volumes sitting on your, your bedside locker, right? I've never read these books, by the way. So. Right, okay, so you've learned all this good stuff. Now you want to learn a bit about tools, right? You can't, you know, you can't do this stuff without actually knowing your tools. You're gonna to be doing most of your development on Linux. You're gonna to have to learn Emacs, obviously. Um, you know, the likes of Bre Brep and Sed are gonna be your friends, so, you know, really learn regular expressions. And the, you know, the tools rule them all, Git, right? The, the, the most amazing, um, addition to our to our, our our tool set over the last few years, the, the gift that keeps on giving. You know, if you haven't you haven't lived until you've learned interactive rebasing, right? Or Git's ref log. And okay, maybe maybe I'm starting to sound a little bit sad. Like that's real beauty, right? So a bit of perspective here. Sorry, I just spent a week sailing in the Caribbean, so I'm still a little bit hung up on uh, on boats. Right. We're getting somewhere. We're almost ready to start working on the project. But I think because it's, you know, OpenStack's obviously an open source project, right? And it's one of the biggest, most diverse um, open source projects that are out there, right? It's really important that when you start working on the project that you really understand open source culture, right? You're really kind of steeped in this um, kind of long tradition of open source culture. So maybe you might, you know, have got your feet wet by just following the Linux kernel mailing list for six months, maybe. Just really understand how decisions get made there, how consensus is built. Um, you know, really get into you know, all the politics and kind of flame wars that happen there. And then after that six months, you might decide that this is a horrible environment and you really want OpenStack to not be like that environment. Um, but, you know, you also kind of need to understand the kind of philosophies that are around, op uh, around open source, right? So you need to understand the the differences of philosophy and opinion between, say, free software advocates and open source advocates, the difference between um, copyleft and you know, permissive licensing, and understand why OpenStack made its choices to use the Apache license and, and say, to reject the open core model. You know, and following on from that, it would be good to understand not just how OpenStack's governance model work, which Thierry has recently described as, um, what was it, representative democracy, um, you know, you might want to understand how, you know, what a, a benevolent dictator is and why some people outside of OpenStack think OpenStack needs a benevolent dictator. Um, you know, you also want to understand release processes and, you know, why OpenStack has gone the route of having a six-month time-based release cycle. Other projects have feature-based release cycles. You know, where, where did the notion of time-based release cycles come from and, and, and what was that choice trying to, trying to solve? But you don't want to have your head just in, in the open source world, right? You want to understand what's happening outside the open source world, take some learnings from that and kind of, you know, bring it back in there. So you want to understand how extreme programming evolves and into Agile and Scrum. You want to understand what continuous integration is and how 
even though you know what we do in OpenStack isn't strictly continuous integration, it's actually better. Um, if you want to understand what DevOps is all about, lean, continuous delivery, all of this good stuff. And you want to read the, the Agile Manifesto, right, to really kind of get into this. I think there's, there's some great learnings in the, in the Agile Manifesto. Getting there, nearly ready to start contributing. Um, the soft skills, right? You've learned all this stuff, but you're not going to go off and build, um, you're not going to go off and build OpenStack on your own. You have to collaborate, right? And so in order to contribute to the project, in order to kind of collaborate and work with other people, you need to have really good communication skills in English, obviously, because English is the only language that matters, right? Um, sarcasm again, remind, remind, trying to remind everyone. Um, yeah, and you might think that, you know, we're only talking about written communication skills here because we're talking about, like, mailing lists and IRC, but don't forget we have a, a you know, a design summit every twice a year, and it's really important you can actually come together there and kind of explain your ideas and kind of argue for your ideas at these summits. So spoken um, English is important too. But I'm not just talking about that, I'm also talking about, you know, really kind of some of the real software skills, right? The notion of you know having empathy. You know, when you when you're in a <coughs> in an environment like an open source project, you really understand you need to understand where conflict is coming from, um, how to kind of put yourself in the shoes of other people when when they're kind of in conflict with you and try and drive some consensus. Um, you know, in a community, the the thing that really holds everyone together is trust, and you know you need to keep building trust. On, Otherwise, the community will gradually fall apart. Um, so, you know, an understanding of kind of how to build trust is, is really important. And I love the, the, the French word savoir-faire, right? The, the knowledge of, of how to do the, the right thing at, at any given moment. And basically what I'm talking about there is just trying to be a better human, right? And I just randomly came across this lady who died last week. And I thought her philosophy in life was, was pretty cool. But if you want some other Random life philosophy here is one that I, I, I like to go for. Just feck and do it. So now we can start contributing to the project, right? Where do you start? Um, for me, the best place to start is code reviews, right? It's, you can get in there, you can kind of start getting to understand the code. Um, you can start you know, building trust with other contributors. You can you know, maybe <clears throat> come along and, and review a really meaty patch, or maybe you can just start triaging some of um, you know, some new patches as they're submitted, trying to find some of the more obvious issues. Um, and you'll move on, and obviously you want to contribute some code, right? Whether that might be, you know, you, um, you pick maybe one of the really gnarly race conditions that we only see in, in continuous integration. Um, and you might go off and you might analyze this bug, and you might come back with this one-line fix, but with a 30-line commit message, and you can really show, you know, that you've thought this issue through. Um, and then you get on to more substantive changes, and you need to learn the skills of you know, being able to um, communicate your ideas, um, kind of spit up um, your code into logical um, sequences of changes, and all this good stuff. And again, when you're working on kind of more substantive changes, you need to be able to kind of write a design document, which, which um, we're now calling specs. We used to call it blueprints. We're now calling specs, I guess. Um, you know, and it's really important there to be able to kind of pull in all the important context to, you know, know the history of, of you know, other, other approaches that have been taken to whatever you're trying to solve, um, you know, think about things like upgrade, um, you know, and get all of this information in a spec to really show that you, uh, you, you know, you've, you've thought it through. But, you know, it, OpenStack isn't just the integrated projects like Nova and Swift and whatnot. You know, there's a lot of cross-project stuff that going, goes on, right? And you, as, a, as an OpenStack contributor, are going to want to not just contribute to one of the integrated projects, you're going to want to try and tackle some of the cross-project issues, like, um, say, the Oslo project, for example, where we're trying to <clears throat> clean up a lot of technical debt within the project, right? You're, you're going to want to allocate some of your time to work on, on this technical debt in Oslo. The client projects always get forgotten. You should spend a little bit of time working on the client projects. As I said, we're porting to Python 3, so everybody should be spending a little bit of time um, working on, on porting to Python 3. And our CI system is, um, you know, I think, really a world beater, really kind of showing the rest of the open source world what can be done, um, and, and the proprietary world, too. 
Um, and it's really important that you know this is another kind of cross-project effort that everyone sees as, as as part of their kind of responsibilities to contribute to. And of course, this is a public-facing cloud system, so security is pretty important. And there's a bunch of different ways you can contribute to security efforts in OpenStack. There's a vulnerability management team that kind of privately handle um, new security bugs and responsibly dis disclose them with the, with the help of vendors. Um, and the, but there's also the OpenStack security group, which does, you know, is trying to create a process for threat analysis, is you know, writing um, notes for kind of security issues that aren't necessarily vulnerabilities, um, and also writing the OpenStack security guide. But you know, also, you, know, you as a, an OpenStack contributor, you know, it's your responsibility to, to always be security-minded, right? or to always understand the secu security of implications of anything you're doing or are reviewing. And the thing that always gets forgotten in any open source project is documentation, right? Developers never remember to, to contribute to, to documentation. So this hero OpenStack developer really needs to spend some time actually contributing to, to documentation as well as all of this other stuff. Um, there's a great team working on OpenStack documentation, but we really need more kind of specific expertise contributing to, to their specific areas. Bugs, one of my, one of my favorite topics. Um, so bugs, whether you know it or not, is, is, act, is actually, you know, uh, bug reports are really one of the, the most kind of valu valuable contributions anyone can make to, to OpenStack, right? We do a lot of automated testing, but, you know, there's 600 configuration options in Nova, so there's only so many, um, there's only so many combinations of those we can test. So we kind of rely on our users to do a lot of their own testing and, and you know, report any bugs um, as bug reports. And so you, as, a, as an OpenStack developer, should be spending time every day kind of triaging these bugs and kind of working through all these bugs to really show that we, we value and, and welcome these bug reports. And along those lines, you know, you should really be spending a, a good bit of time, you know, engaging with users, whether that's forums like ask.openstack.org or whether it's going along to meetups, whether it's giving presentations, whether it's on the OpenStack operators mailing list. You know, listen to our users and really, um, you know, help them drive your priorities. I mentioned mailing lists there. I'm running out of steam here, but this is all the things you need to be doing as an OpenStack contributor, remember? You, re you really, really need to be on the OpenStack developer mailing list. You know, even though we have uh, something like 2,500 um, emails per month, you know, it's really important that you kind of track all of these emails and you know, kind of look for areas that you can kind of jump in and, and you know, help drive a conversation towards a positive conclusion. Um, but one of the interesting things that's happening is because the mailing list is so overloaded, a lot of the conversations actually happen on IRC. So don't remember, or don't forget to kind of log into IRC and kind of keep an eye on what's going on there. And even when you're asleep, keep your IRC client running so you can kind of check it in the morning and kind of catch up on what's happened overnight. Oh, and yeah, this is kind of a, a favorite of mine. It's like, don't forget, we're having a bit of fun here, right? We're trying to build you know, a healthy community, we should be building friendships, right? So it, this, when I'm talking about IRC here, it's not just about, you know, design discussions or working through bugs on IRC or whatever. It's actually getting to know people, right? It's actually trying to, to build some friendships. Um, but be wary of forming cliques, right? We don't want to, we want this to be a diverse, welcoming project, so we don't want it to devolve into some cliques of, you know, I guess white, white male, US-centric kind of geek humor on IRC, you know, we want it to be open to everyone. And a kind of along the theme of cliquishness, you know, um, some people, out, some of OpenStack's detractors try and claim that OpenStack developers are kind of so focused on the code that they're working on, they're kind of ignoring um, the, the work that operators are doing. So I think, you know, there's been some great suggestions out there like Lorian Hochstein um, suggested that maybe operators could um, adopt a developer um, so, you know, a developer could come along and shadow an operator for maybe a couple of days and really understand the challenges the operator are facing and, and report back those issues to the project. So I think, you know, as a, an OpenStack contributor, you really want to be, make sure you're getting as much hand, hands-on time with real, um, you know, OpenStack operation issues as possible. And as part of that, contributing to kind of operator's tools. Um, my personal favorite at the moment is the, the Triple O project within OpenStack, where we're trying to bring together as much um, 
you know, expertise and knowledge and contributions within OpenStack about, about how to operate OpenStack. Okay, so I'm going to have to fly through this quickly. So, you know, you've got to this point, you've, you've done all this work, and naturally you're going to want to start, you know, stepping up towards leadership positions. You're going to want to try and become the PTL of a project or, you know, get elected to the technical committee or the OpenStack board of directors. In all of this, you know, you're probably employed by someone who cares about the work you're doing. So, you know, you've got to take seriously your responsibility to, um, you know, bridge the gap between your employer, your employer's needs and kind of what's happening in, in the upstream project and kind of make that, uh, you know, not conflict, right, to really understand how to bridge the two. So you should men mentor, I'm going to try and fly, fly through these quickly, you should mentor new contributors, you should keep an eye on media, what, what people are saying about OpenStack. You should look at what our competitor is doing, you should keep an eye on what's going on in Stackforge, you should look at kind of new emerging technologies that are coming on, right? This is what I'm getting at, right? It's, you know, someone who places these expectations on themselves, someone who thinks they can do all of these things, they're just going to burn out, right? So do we have unreasonable expectations for what an OpenStack developer should be? Um, and I think we do. And I think the lesson from this is, is actually, you know, people when they come along, and I say this to any kind of new Red Hat developer that comes along, you know, try and find your, find your niche within the project, right? You don't have to try and do everything. You don't have to try and have to tackle all of these things. Any one of these things I mentioned, mentioned before could be your one little, one little area of trying to contribute to the project. And my favorite example of that is a good friend of mine from back in my GNOME days, you know, made a huge impact on the GNOME project simply by forming a team um, to triage bug reports, right? And this is where my passion for bug reports come from. You know, he showed me the value of um, the contribution that is bug reports, but also the contribution that is triaging bugs. Um, so this guy went on, to, and he's now the Assistant General Counsel of the Wikimedia Foundation, um, but originally he just triaged bugs. So I guess the summary I'm trying to get at here is, you know, we have these unreasonable expectations, I think, for what an OpenStack developer should be. And if that's hindering any of, you, any of you from contributing to the project, if you think, I can't contribute to the project because I need to do all of those things, I'm trying to reject that notion here, right? There are so many different varied little ways you can contribute to the project. And I'd really like us within the project to learn how to kind of celebrate these kind of diverse contributions, to really kind of empathize with people who are, you know, really focused on specific areas and not, you know, not working on other areas. And I'd love to, us for us to kind of experiment with di different ways of recognizing the, the, the various ways people can contribute to the project. Um, and not just always celebrate the developers who are contributing the most number of commits per release, but kind of really celebrate all the different ways people can contribute to the project. Because I'd love every single one of you here to be contributing to the project. Thank you very much.